but I um hello everybody good afternoon my name is Adela Pineda and I am the director of the Teresa Lozano Long Latin American Studies here at UT Austin. It is with great pleasure that I um, invite you for this conversation with a very dear and admired colleagues of mine who are experts in cinema studies. Um, we are here to present a new dossier to be published in Studies in Spanish and Latin American Cinema, the journals whose editor is Professor Ana Lopez, on new approaches of Mexican cinema. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the inception of this project. I think it was two, two years ago, three years ago, when we gathered at a, I think it was MLA or LASA, MLA, um, 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 you know, Congress, where we put together a panel in which we wanted to revisit the idea of Mexican cinema as national cinema. Out of that conversation came a very interesting approaches, so we decided to keep on studying these possibilities, and thanks to the generosity of Ana Lopez, we got the opportunity to submit it for uh, consideration as a dossier in this journal. Um, I will briefly let you know why we think of new approaches. We are always saying new approaches to this and that. Why new approaches to Mexican cinema? When you hear the word Mexican cinema, the first images that come to your mind are Cantinflas, Dolores del Rio, Maria Felix, that is the golden age of Mexican cinema. Because Mexican cinema created an imagine that was envisioned as Mexicanidad. And this was the paradigm of Mexican cinema for the whole of the 20th century for several years. So we wanted to see if we can actually see or think of Mexican cinema in these terms. And if so, in which terms can we actually reassess the range and scope of Mexican cinema? Why is now, why in this moment? Well, there are historical reasons the neoliberal turn has affected the way we do the exhibit and circulate cinema. This neoliberal turn has created possibly good opportunities for the industry to grow beyond transnational uh, level, but it has also created precarious conditions for filmmaking. But besides this historical determinant, there are others that has to do with the way we think of culture in the 21st century. And the way we think of culture in the 21st century has challenged the idea of the national as a paradigm to understand culture. Why? Because there is displacement, because there is migration, because there are diasporas, and because culture is now embedded in different other fields, including science, including the STEM sciences, including the social science. So we are in a moment where the humanities and the social sciences in the natural sciences are thinking that there are very urgent questions to address that has to do with nature, with technology, with people moving across borders. There is also the theoretical terms. We have to go beyond certain paradigms that define the century. And now we are thinking of other type of theoretical approaches, such as affect, such as eco-criticism, such as technology and internet. So because of all these phenomena, because of all these considerations, we thought that these four contributions for our journal um, were going to touch upon any of these aspects in a certain way. We don't have a definite answer of what is Mexican cinema as international or transnational. We just wanted to join the conversation. Uh, and this is what 
we are trying. So let me ask Anna, let us know a little bit more about this framework. Anna Lopez is that everybody knows Anna Lopez and she doesn't need a thorough introduction. But just let me tell you that she's professor of communication and director of the Cuban and Caribbean Studies Institute at Tulane University, where she also serves as associate provost for faculty affairs. Her research focusing on Latin America, Latino, and cultural studies has produced marvelous books, collections, editions, among which I should just mention with Marvin Dupo and Laura Pudalski, the Rutledge Companion of Latin American um, So, Anna, thank you so much again. Um, welcome to this virtual space of Lila Grants. Thank you, Adela. It's, it's a great um, pleasure to be here and to share this afternoon with you and, and our audience and you guys who have been such wonderful contributors. Um, as Adela mentioned, you know, I was part of the original panel back in prehistoric pre-COVID times, whenever that was, but I do remember it was an MLA and I do remember it was Seattle. Uh, and I think, I think I actually talked about something that uh, I was spinning off out of a quote from Monsi Weiss. And I think my paper was called Es Inmoral Llorar a Solas, because I was, I was trying to rethink uh, how melodrama works in the 21st century and how our effective responses to media have shifted so dramatically since the golden age of Mexican cinema. So how, what does it mean to talk about melodrama today in the context of no longer, you know, the three handkerchief, handkerchief weepy that the golden age brought us, but in the context of the torrid love affairs that we have with Netflix series, right? Where, you know, it, it's all consuming. It's like, it's like literally like a love affair. You know, you meet on Friday night and you're done by Monday morning um, because you've consumed the entire series. Um, so like, you know, uh, the difference between Maria Candelaria and Casa de las Flores. Uh, in the context of that panel and that session, where all these wonderful papers were originally presented, we began to fantasize over at brunch, because we are panels on a Sunday. I remember that. Um, you know, what do we do with this material? It was a, um, it wasn't a regular session. It was a forum kind of session, right? So it was very short presentations. And none of us were in the mood to develop these into longer papers. We felt they were very strong interventions as they were. And we started fantasizing about uh, turning this into a dossier for studies in Spanish and Latin American cinemas, which Adela, thankfully, brought into uh, fruition uh, subsequently. So the issue, um, is the, the issue in which the dossier appears is 18.3, and it is about to uh, appear in print. Um, I want to show you something that is a... Um, a sidebar for the journal, which is what a, a site that is called SLAC Extras, that's Studies in Latin American Cinema Extra Resources. And we have wonderful uh, extra materials for all the articles in the dossier, ranging from um, ex more extended explorations and materials about particular directors, particular films, uh, reflections on facets of the discussion in the article that never made it actually into the article. So I strongly encourage you to reach out to SLAC Extras and explore further after you have the opportunity um, to read uh, the essays in the dossier. Uh, as Adela was, was mentioning, I, I think that even more, even beyond challenging the national as a paradigm for the study of Mexican cinema. What the essays, the essays point to is the need to look at Mexican cinema as part of much larger constellations of, of thought, of theory, but also of practice, right? Because Mexican cinema, not that it ever did, I would argue Mexican cinema was always a transnational cinema. That wasn't a very popular argument 30 years ago, but I think it's caught on. Um, but uh, particularly now, uh, you have to look at multiple vectors and uh, forces of influence that impact all, all, all cinema, 
and particularly Mexican cinema. So it's a particularly fertile time in which to shatter the limits under which we've, we've looked at the national cinema, but in multiple perspective, not just the transnational, but multiple vectors. And I think that's what the, um, that's what the dossier really accomplishes um, beautifully. Uh, it was very well received by the readers that reviewed it. Uh, Studies in Spanish and Latin America cin cinemas is a double blind journal. Uh, and this was thoroughly peer reviewed and thoroughly adored. So I'm delighted that it's finally uh, coming to light despite all the COVID delays that we all experience in everything in our lives. Um, so Adela, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, so I would like to now, you know, um, ask the collaborators uh, to talk a little bit about each of their contributions. And we will start with um, Edgardo Tormos, who was born and raised in Puerto Rico and um, has a research agenda focused on 20th century Latin American with film, specifically the representations of revolutions and insurgencies. He has a different um, book project on bodily objection as a literary and thematic trope that enables novel critical approaches to the study of revolutions and insurgencies in Mexico. Edgardo earned his PhD from Boston University recently in 2022. I am very proud of him. And he's currently also at the Institute. So, Edgardo. Hello, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's glad, I'm glad to be here. It's great to be here. Um, thank you to the center. Thank you to Dr. Pineda Franco, to SLAC, and to my colleagues who are here presenting today. Uh, and it is really a treat and a pleasure to be here. Uh, allow me to share my screen while I share some slides with you. Hopefully you'll get to see these images and sort of follow along as I try to cram three films worth of information here into a couple of minutes of your time. So without further ado, um, I am presenting here about an article that I wrote uh, it is titled Alfredo Joskovich, Corporeal Objection and Counterculture in Independent Mexican Cinema After 1968. Um, so uh, this whole thing about objection is, is, is part about, of, my, of my general uh, interest uh, for research. I am interested in objection um, as sort of a literary trope like uh, Dr. Pineda mentioned. I am sort of following uh, Julia Cristeva's uh, definition of objection uh, as that which is jettisoned to and draws one to uh, the place where meaning collapses. So that is just overall my framework, uh, just to give you an idea of where I am coming from. Uh, my, my interest in Alfredo Joskovich particularly, and particularly his early filmography, is motivated by uh, his influence on other independent filmmakers of the time of the early 1970s uh, and his reputation among them as he helped shape a generation of independent Mexican filmmakers. Um, he, uh, I argue, was a pioneer figure in the staging of abject bodies uh, as symbolic protests against certain time-worn discourses of the great post-revolutionary family. Uh, his tendency to represent bodily objection became a sort of late motif uh, of the countercultural independent cinema of early 1970s. Um, and like Vasquez Mantecon has argued in his book on Super 8, uh, the verification of mystery became irrefutable proof of compromise and militancy in the cinema. Uh, so what I am trying to address here are three films that I examine in the article. Uh, and we can appreciate in these three early films, uh, Joskovich's sort of multifaceted approaches to dissidents, from filmic countercultural trendsetter to an outspoken and unpopular critic of the armed insurgency fervor that took over uh, radical student worker and campesino movements of the time. Uh, so to start, I am going to start with Krates, his very first uh, full length feature. The plot of uh, Karate starts in media res from the perspective of a midday television show uh, as camera and host walk into a random middle class home to find its male owner in a move out frenzy. 
he has uh, flung open the doors of his house and has invited them in to take all of his personal belongings and money since he no longer needs them. And we can see him here uh, starting to burn his belongings. Uh, the protagonist sets out on a journey to nature and the spectator follows him to see him perform the life of a modern day hippie or hippiteca as they were known at the time in Mexico. Uh, and we see Crates uh, played here by Leobardo Lopez Areche swim naked in a pond, eat algae off the pond, defecate on their tree, adopt a cave dwelling lifestyle, eat off of the trash dump among dogs. Uh, we see him cut the umbilical cord of his newborn with his teeth just before um, licking him clean. So we realize that the modern hippiteca who abandons social conventions and confronts uh, uh, the comforts of middle class or bourgeois life is also uh, an embodiment of the ancient cynic. So uh, bodily and abjection is part and parcel of this ancient philosophical current that favored an ethics of nonconformist, uh, confrontational corporeality against idealist uh, social norms. Um, so this film, however, ends on a happy sort of utopian note as the new family ventures further into nature and uh, successfully adopts a countercultural lifestyle based on voluntary objection from the ruling symbolic order. So they are they're fine. They walk off into nature and, and they live happily ever after. Uh, El Cambio, on the other hand, comes from a very different uh, angle and tone. It tells the story of two young artists who get fed up with their precarious city lives and decide to search for a new, more authentic life in nature. So they escape to a remote beach town and set up camp, uh, but right away their idyllic foray into nature is immediately tainted by the reality of environmental pollution. When they decide to go for a swim, they discover that the water is heavily contaminated with toxic runoffs from a factory being built nearby. Uh, so these young idealists uh, soon decide to take on the evident corruption schemes taking place in the remote fishing village. And they decide to cut their hair and shave their hippiteca beards in order to seem more trustworthy to the locals. These uh, urban youngsters wanted to assimilate. Uh, they wanted to learn how to fish from the fishermen and then in turn teach them how to organize in, uh, for their interests right, against the uh, corrupt authorities. So uh, sadly, they fail. They become pariahs of the town. Uh, and in frustration, they decide to spoil the inaugural festivities for the factory. And what they do is they dump buckets of the hazardous, hazardous runoff uh, onto the town authorities and the corrupt officials. So uh, after this, they are followed by the police. They are caught near their beachside dwellings, and they are executed for their transgressions. So this is already a radical departure from the film we have just discussed, Krates. Uh, there's no tolerance for cynical antics here. There is no space for subverting order. And their decision to adopt a more militant stance, maybe than Krates, more confrontational, uh, and make their objection collective in this public uh, activity, uh, transgressed uh, sort of a fatal boundary. Um, and then we can see that here, objections start to acquire a negative valence here. So. Uh, the last film kind of uh, brings this home, brings it together. Uh, it's called Meridiano Cien. And this film uh, is a loose adaptation of Marguerite Lucenar's short story, Aphrodisia the Widow, right? Uh, so this film follows a group of guerrilleros that deal with the capture and execution of their leader, uh, internal treason, and also alienation from other political subjects they are on the run from the military effectively. Uh, the most committed guerrillero of the group, uh, who is called Rojo, engages in an adulterous affair with the town doctor's wife uh, called Maura. So much like the short story, the film highlights how the protagonist's libidinal excesses lead to the demise of the guerrillero's mission, right? So their moral and political ineffectiveness is also highlighted as they fail to convince the local campesinos to join their cause. Uh, the survivors of this militant group fail, they are captured, and they are beheaded, and their heads are displayed on spikes atop the town's church. Uh, 
uh, Meridiano Cien thus uh, revives an old liter literary trope uh, of the use of mutilated bodies as a deterrent against lawlessness and abjection as a negative byproduct of revolutionary activity uh, that has degraded into banditry. The plot is set in the mountains surrounding Mexico, Mexico City, but the film's contemporary historical context alludes probably to the strongest armed guerrilla groups of the time, uh, which were fighting in the mountains of Guerrero instead, uh, namely the Partido de los Pobres and the Asociación Cívica Nacional Revolucionaria. The film received much negative criticism as a reactionary, cautionary tale against insurgent movements of the time. Uh, so to bring this all together in conclusion and end my intervention, I am, my intent is to demonstrate how Joskovich's early filmography can help us explore sort of lesser known corpus of Mexican film, uh, whose main impetus was to reject hegemonic values, right, that were disseminated through national cinema. But also, I wanted to show how much of this independent cinema responded uh, in various ways to a violent state repression of the dissidents that took place in the early 1970s after 1968. Joskovich effectively traced a line in the sand. Uh, he could not and would not endorse the concept of armed insurgency in his films. Uh, instead, he chose the staging of bodily objection that initially uh, stood for sort of a biopolitical insurrection and turned it into something else, right? He, he would soon uh, make it a, a negative trope for the dissuasion of armed insurgency. Uh, in other words, what was what was abject before uh, was now uh, also abject, but in the sense that it was impossible to include armed insurgency in the imaginary order of this uh, of this filmmaker. So counterculture and militancy were effectively split in this early fil filmic corpus of Mexican independent cinema, uh, uh, which was an important cultural repository of leftist opposition to state hegemony, right? So I wanted to show how uh, basically Joskovich's uh, early cinema run the gamut of, of this ideological spectrum that made up the, the early student cinema of the 1970s. 1970s. So thank you very much for, for the time uh, and I look forward to other people's contributions. Thank you. Thank you, Edgardo. I know that I am breaking, my voice is not clear. Let me know if it breaks, no? I just need to introduce Thomas. Can you hear me? Yeah? Okay, Thomas Matusiak is an assistant professor in the humanities at the University of Social Sciences and Humanities in Poland. Uh, which is a scholar of modern and contemporary Latin American cultural studies. His research and teaching interests span from 20th and to 21st century Latin American literature, cinema, and visual culture. At the present, he's finalizing a book manuscript with a great title, The Visual Guillotine, Latin America and the Cinema of Cultural. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, thank you, Adela, um, for uh, for inviting me both originally in the MLA panel uh, and and for all your your work and your help um, uh, organizing uh, the volume. Thank you also, Paloma, for 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 your organization uh, of this event. Uh, Anna, also for all your help with the with the with the journal and uh, and to all the the other presenters. Uh, so I'm going to be speaking briefly about the article that I've contributed to the issue, which is uh, a Jaguar in Paris, Teo Hernandez's shamanic cinema. And uh, I'm going to, so what I'm going to talk about today is more just uh, providing a preview or a trailer of the article uh, that'll, uh, uh, that'll appear soon. And I'm going to do that by um, uh, inscribing the article in these constellations and trends that, uh, that Adela and, and Anna have mentioned in their introduction. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about uh, sort of situating this article kind of in the discipline uh, of Mexican and Latin American film studies and, and talking about what types of disciplinary trends and constraints uh, led me to Teo Hernandez and to the ideas in this article. Uh, so, but first I'm gonna start just with a little bit of background information uh, for those who aren't familiar with Teo Hernandez and his work. 
And um, Pedro Hernandez uh, was born in, in Michoacán in 1939. Uh, he um, um, moved to Mexico City to study architecture uh, at the UNAM. Uh, at that point, he got very involved in the uh, cine, club, uh, cine club culture in Mexico City um, and uh, eventually dropped out of his, uh, of his architecture program. In 1966, uh, shortly after he, um, uh, he moved to Paris uh, and he uh, stayed there largely um, until uh, his death in 1992 at the heights of the AIDS epidemic uh, in France. And uh, he traveled uh, widely during that time uh, uh, in Europe, uh, but also um, in uh, to Morocco, Northern Africa. Uh, and, and he did return to Mexico towards the end of his life. Uh, there's very little in his archive, at least um, until now, that's uh, in his writing about why he decided to leave. Um, although uh, he was very open about his sexuality, and so we can sort of assume that that's, that's uh, a factor. Um, he didn't begin filmmaking until he arrives in Paris um, um, in, in the late 60s, uh, just before the 68 movement. Uh, and uh, while he's in France, uh, uh, between the, the late 60s and the early 90s, he produces a vast, um, uh, body of work on Super 8. Uh, this is all sort of very experimental work, uh, uh, avant-garde, um, ranging from uh, short film diaries, kind of in the style of Jonas Mekas, uh, to very abstract work in the vein of Stan Brakhage, uh, to feature length work. Um, so, uh, so, very so very experimental and also a very diverse body of work. Uh, but all of it, with a few exceptions, when he experimented with um, 16 millimeter and video, uh, all of it on Super 8. Uh, and uh, now, after his death, um, that entire body of work was donated to the Pompidou in Paris by his partner, the French artist, Michel Nijad. So it's all very well preserved, very well documented. Um, and uh, in fact, my first encounter with Taylor and cinema was with, um, with someone who had just gotten back from the Pompidou researching uh, a completely different project who had been approached on, on um, actually on Najat, on, on Hernandez's um, uh, partner. And, uh, and the archivist approached them, this was, and said, you know, are you familiar with Teo Hernandez? Do you know, you know, are you familiar with this work? Because we have this huge archive and no one is, no one is researching it. Uh, and so that was my first contact and it was the first, sort of the first, uh, first thing that interested me is why, you know, what's going on with this archive? Why is this, um, why is this sort of just sitting there? And why is there, why was there so little work being done on, on Hernandez given the size of this archive? Um, now, uh, after that, um, my next encounter was, uh, with the, uh, 2018, uh, there was a, um, retrospective of Teo Hernandez's work in Mexico in 2018 at the Centro de la Imagen. This was the first retrospective of Hernandez's work in Mexico. Uh, and it was striking to me that this was not at the Cineteca. This was not in a cinematic space. This was at the Centro de la Imagen. And it was uh, curated by uh, Andrea Ancira Garcia. Uh, so uh, this, throughout uh, Hernandez's work, he dialogues um, uh, a lot with Mexican cinema, with the stars of the golden age, with El Indio Fernandez. Uh, there is a lot of meditation on cinema itself and on Mexican cinema specifically. So that was also sort of striking to me as to why uh, most of the interest was coming from uh, art historians and curators. Uh, so I'll, I'll get into sort of kind of the details of, you know, what I think about this and why, why what's going on sort of behind the scenes here, uh, disciplinarily speaking, why was this kind of blind spot created? Because, um, you know, with this exhibition, interest in Teo Hernandez has sort of, you know, uh, now taken off. Uh, and I think also the uh, 2017 um, uh, exhibition Ism, 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 uh, which was on Latin American experimental film, which is co-curated co by Jesse Lerner and Luciano Piazza uh, as part of the Pacific Standard Time uh, Initiative uh, funded by the Getty. That also featured Teo Hernandez. And so now his profile has definitely risen. Uh, but uh, now, so 
So, um, so I'm going to go back now to, 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 to explain why, why this happened. Um, first of all, Super 8 hasn't been studied until very recently. Uh, there's, uh, so uh, Edgardo mentioned Alvaro Vasquez Mantecon's uh, uh, sort of landmark work on Super 8 in Mexico. Uh, and I know that Alvaro had a sort of got a lot of pushback disciplinarily on this book. It was not necessarily easy for him to do this. Super 8 was not considered uh, a sort of legitimate cinema. Uh, it was an amateur format introduced in 1968 by Kodak, uh, really intended for home filmmakers. Um, and, uh, but because it was relatively inexpensive compared to 35 millimeter film or even 16 millimeter film, uh, it was really, uh, it really took off with political filmmakers, um, uh, collectives of filmmakers and experimental filmmakers. Um, so Alvaro's work, however, the one, the one thing I noticed here is that he completely writes Teo Hernandez out of this history of Mexican super eight cinema. Uh, and he does this explicitly. He, he, he justifies it in the introduction to his book saying that he's interested in a national history of super eight. Uh, Teo Hernandez was working in France. He was not necessarily dialoguing with the super ochero movement in Mexico city, which was quite organized um, uh, locally. And, uh, and for that reason, he says, you know, uh, even though there are some references to Mexico in Teo Hernandez's work, um, Vasquez Mantecon says basically, you know, he's not a Mexican super eight filmmaker. Uh, and um, so, so clearly one of the blind spots here is, is the framework of national cinema, right? So obviously Alvaro Vasquez Mantecon's work is a, is, is a sort of landmark work, fantastic work. I'm not criticizing him for it. I just want to point out that this framework of national cinema is um, writes out, the, you know, an exilic filmmaker like Teo Hernandez, uh, as well as other transnational filmmakers uh, who are working on Super 8. Uh, I'm thinking, for example, of someone like Silvia Gruner. Uh, and now, the, the, the point I'm also, I also, or something that also motivates this is that Super 8, because it is outside the institutions of state funding of cinema, especially in the 70s during the Echevarria uh, years, uh, provides sort of access to filmmaking and cinematic expression to groups uh, like, in, in Silvia Gruner's case, feminist filmmakers, in Teo Hernandez's case, queer uh, filmmakers who don't necessarily fit in the molds of the institutional, the institutional frameworks of filmmaking. Uh, so I was interested in looking at international, transnational uh, Super 8, precisely because Super 8 was such a transnational uh, format. Uh, I know uh, Isabel Arredondo has done some really interesting uh, work on uh, international Super 8. So um, because Super 8 was so portable, so cheap, uh, there were um, many, many, many international uh, festivals of Super 8. Uh, so this was circulating quite a bit. Uh, Super 8, just based on the materiality itself, was uh, lent itself to transnationalism. Um, so, so those are some of the uh, so some of the concerns of the sort of disciplinary blind spots. How someone like Teo Hernandez could kind of slip through the cracks. Um, and you know, when I, d I dug a little deeper, um, I. I sort of, I began studying how uh, Teo Hernandez in fact was very engaged with Mexico, not just in a nostalgic sense. And I know that that is a very typical sort of criticism of, of exilic filmmakers or exilic intellectuals, uh, generally speaking, right? Because they're in exile, uh, they're not uh, directly plugged into national discourses, therefore they don't count as, as national figures. Uh, but Teo Hernandez was very directly in, engaged with Mexican cinema, um, and, uh, and here I, I want to uh, refer back to uh, one of the comments Adela made in the introduction, which was uh, this question of Mexicanidad in, in Mexican film studies. And how can we, if not necessarily go beyond Mexicanidad, then at least question its role as the operative category in our analysis? Because I think Teo Hernandez offers a, um, a, 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 a fascinating case of a filmmaker who deliberately queers Mexicanidad in his relationship with uh, El Indio Fernandez, which I analyze in the article. Uh, the way that he represents El Indio Fernandez when he meets him, uh, photographs him, interviews him, the, uh, and, and how he relates to sort of this, this figure. He himself, he imagines himself or as a, a or models his, uh, his persona on this excessive 
uh, queer Indio Fernandez. Um, and so he departs, he imagines himself as a shaman. He imagines himself as, as, as sort of descending all equally from, from in, indigenous roots. Uh, and begins to theorize cinema through uh, um, these primitivist categories. Uh, I won't say indigenous categories because what he's really doing is in the vein of an avant-garde primitivism of appropriating concepts like uh, ritual and trance uh, to, to theorize spectacle, kind of in the vein of, of other intellectuals like, like Antonio Nardo. Um, so, uh, so there is a disengagement still, despite what, what, what Vasquez Mantecon says, that even though you know, he's in this exilic context, he is engaging with uh, national cinema. Um, the other uh, element that interests me here uh, that is, I think, part of this, um, uh, these wider trends, uh, and I think maybe this will be the last point, that, the, the point that I can end on, uh, is the intermediality of the cinema. Uh, so Teo Hernandez worked or collaborated, he, was a, he, he collaborated with um, uh, painters, uh, musicians, and choreographers especially. Uh, and, and he worked uh, in, in our collective that was called Metro Bus Roche Show, which is named after just the, the, the metro stop that was closest to where he, Nijad, and his friends lived. Uh, and um, while so so although this is an intermedial uh, this is an intermedial cinema, um, it, it is still very much uh, reflecting on uh, the. It, it's still very much a film theory in itself. So uh, so De Hernandez is reflecting on sort of the affective exper affective experiences of viewing films, how he can uh, impact uh, spectators and sort of simulate a state of trance, simulate a ritual. Uh, so he's very much thinking about the limits of the medium, uh, even though he's engaging, you know, dance and painting uh, in, in, in his abstraction of the, of the cinematic image. Uh, so, so I'll conclude with that uh, and, uh, and, and thank you all. Thank you, Thomas. I hope I'm not breaking too far. Um, we have here a stalker who just joined the conversation. And uh, welcome, Nacho, uh, to the panel. And we'd love to hear your comments at the end as well. Um, so let's let's proceed with Olivia. Olivia Cosentino is a Stemmerate Stone postdoctoral fellow at the Stone Center for Latin American Studies at Tulane University. And her research focuses on affect, gender, stardom, and dictatorship post golden age and contemporary Mexican cinema published in several journals, including the Velvet Life Trap and Journal of Cinema Studies, and is co-editor of From Lucha Libre to Cine Familiar and Other Churros, University of Florida Press, uh, coming this year, and is currently developing her monograph, Starscape, Youth, Modernity, and Media in Mexico. Welcome, Olivia. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Adela, for the warm welcome. Thank you also to Anna for shepherding us through this dossier process. Um, what a treat to be here with all of you and yeah, to think about new ways to approach Mexican cinema. Um, so as Adela said, I'm working on a monograph right now that's about star studies. So many of you probably know that my work um, thinks about star studies and mediascapes and popular culture um, like in 20th century Mexico, but that is not at all what this work is on. Um, there's slight overlap in terms of my engagement with affect theory and also thinking a little bit about spectatorship, but this, um, this is really another line of research for me. Um, so this, this article, which like Adela mentioned, is a bit more methodological, um, is entitled Writing from the Gut, Embodied Spectatorship and Violence in Contemporary Mexican Cinema. Um, and it's a very personal piece for me. And I think that um, some of the intervention that I make here is hopefully to get us to think about our own roles as critics um, and how we are or are not able to um, you know, divorce our own personal spectatorship from the kind of criticism that we're writing. 
Um, and I was thinking back to why this line of research started. And I remembered that my very first semester of graduate school is when um, the massacre of the 43, 43 students of Ayotzinapa happened. Um, and I think that was a really foundational moment for me, especially just having entered into thinking about um, Mexico and cultural studies and what it means to be someone studying Mexico. And it made me keenly aware of the dynamics of power, of precarity, um, of corruption, of violence in Mexico, and how we see that in represented in um, cultural production, specifically cinema. Um, but in general, my interest really is this growing constellation of Mexican cinema that does does not show violence, that rather um, engages with this really violent subject matter without sensationalizing it um, and oftentimes displacing it off screen. And so I personally read that as a response to things that many of us have seen, Narcos or the super popular telenovela, El Señor de los Cielos. Um, and thinking about maybe a more ethical form of engaging with a topic that I think is um, impossible to avoid. Um, so in that, I'm really interested in how moving away from these direct indexical representations of violence um, in both fiction and nonfiction cinema can lead us to other conclusions, um, can lead us to deeper thinking, perhaps. Um, and just to sort of situate this work, I'm definitely not alone in thinking about violence in Mexican cinema. Um, in the past few years, uh, Neve Thornton just published Tastemakers and Tastemaking, Mexican, Mexico and Curated Screen Violence, which thinks about violence, but also curation um, and taste within Mexican cinema. Um, and then also Miriam Hadu's new book, which was just published in 2022. Um, which it's called Violence, Conflict, and Discourse in Mexican Cinema, and she's looking at 2002 to 2015. Um, so sort of a similar time period that I'm interested in. Um, but I think in general, what my work is trying to do is think about what is the cinema doing if it's not recreating this violence? Um, if the goal is not somehow to documented. I mean, there are plenty of examples of, um, you know, I'm just thinking like Les Tres Muertes de Maricela Escobedo, um, like that, I would say is a bit more um, attempting to document a case, right, and uh, doesn't necessarily shy away from violent images. But um, in this sort of corpus that I'm looking at, without direct representations, what is the purpose? What is the goal? Um, and so, in thinking about that, I'm always already thinking about spectatorship um, and sort of moved by my own interest in my own spectatorship. Um, and so some of this investigation started with uh, Las Elegidas from David Pablos um, in 2015, which is a fictional film about sex trafficking. Um, and then later, the film that I talk about in this article um, is a nonfiction film called Tempestad by Tatiana Hueso. Um, and within the article itself, uh, I talk a little bit about my own experience in going to see the film. Um, I saw it at Cinepolis Diana. Um, so oftentimes at the Cinepolis in Mexico, they'll have one screen dedicated to Mexican cinema. They were showing Tempestad, which I'm not honestly surprised because it did very well at the Cineteca. So I imagine um, they thought that they would probably get some revenue, um, which I imagine they did. Um, but when I was watching it though, I'm, a, I'm an avid note taker of films whenever I see them in the dark, wherever, no matter what, I have to be taking notes. And it was the first time that I could remember that I stopped taking notes. Um, and I very distinctly remember thinking that I would just never write about this film, that I was uninterested. Um, so therefore notes would be of no use to me. Um, which is really amusing because obviously now I've sat with it a bunch, right? And thought about it a lot. Um, but what I began to realize is that after seeing this film, it still bothered me. It continued bothering me. 
And actually, it's it's funny that Nacho just showed up because we had a conversation about this, about how um, he had shown Tempestad to his students. They all apparently hated the film. Um, and then they continued to bring it up and refer back to it all semester. Um, so I found it fascinating that uh, his group of students had a very similar experience to my own, that um, the sort of phenomenon of being very turned off by the film in the moment, um, but still there was some sort of impetus that made me return to it. Um, and as someone who's already interested in affect theory, this immediately piqued my interest thinking, um, what's going on here effectively? Um, it wasn't something that I could put into words. It wasn't something necessarily that I knew that I was feeling. And so for that reason, um, I turned to affect theory in order to sort of think through some of these, um, this, this sort of phenomenon that, that was happening. Um, and so the methodological approach that I'm proposing here is drawing from Deleuzian affect theory, which um, differentiates affect from emotion. So affect being this sort of pre-personal, pre-conscious, um, this entity that has yet to uh, solidify into discourse or solidify into something that's recognizable as an emotion or a feeling. Um, and following in the vein of like Laura Podolsky's work or Milo Koret's work, um, within affect and Latin American cinema. Um, neither one necessarily are talking about violence, but um, both of their work gesture towards the, the productive possibilities of this. Um, but I decided to take it in a bit more of a personal direction simply because this was a short piece. Oftentimes dossiers uh, allow for a bit more experimentation and so I was grateful for the opportunity to sort of um, move into almost sort of a personal ethnography a bit or, or a bit of auto theory. Um, the, the article is mostly grounded in close readings, but um, I theorized based on the gut feelings that I had um, and sort of questioning this constant need as a critic to be objective. Um, I tend to think that it's nearly impossible to be objective all the time, especially when we're dealing with really difficult subject matter like violence. Um, whether or not we as critics are acknowledging that, I don't know, but uh, this idea of writing from the gut for me also disrupts the imposed hierarchy of mind over body. So rather um, rejecting necessarily the need to be objective, but rather embracing uh, the subjective. And so in doing this, I sort of bring together affect theory along with um, formalism and affect that has been popular in film studies, especially thinking about Bryn Kema um, and her insistence on film form, as well as her work on disgust and thinking about sort of the stylistic ways this cinema might offer viewers, um, for lack of a better word, access um, or entry into an effective circuit. Um, so my own gut feelings are what led me to analyze the particular scenes that I talk about in this article that I see as um, opening up new possibilities about thinking about violence in a more nuanced way, in a more systemic way. Um, but a lot of what I'm arguing is that, and I think that this goes for broader than Tempestad, um, how the film sows future effective resonances that are absolutely not accessible in, upon the first viewing, but rather um, the film unsettles the audience and sort of plants the seed to later make sense of the film. And so uh, the, the writing of the article, um, funny enough, was uh, part of my making sense of the film. And so um, in sort of a nice, beautiful, full circle way, um, I'm seeing, I think I'm, the article is working through um, what these affective resonances 
are doing to spectators or at least doing to me. Um, but to kind of move towards a conclusion, and I think um, it, the beauty of this is that uh, I don't think that this is specific to Mexican cinema. Um, I think that this is especially subjective documentary has been on the rise within Latin America. I would also suggest, even though I don't really dive into this in the article, that this is maybe something that is more, um, uh, more important to think about in terms of women directors, um, but that this sort of approach might be a new way to think about um, the rise in subjective documentary, as well as this increase in of an interest in violent subject matter that doesn't exactly show up on screen. But I'm happy to talk more about this. And I'm always very curious to hear people's reactions to films and their own experiences as spectators, because that's, I think, a new way forward in criticism. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you very much. Now we pass to Caroline Ofornov, who is assistant professor of Spanish at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, her research examines how Mexican and Central American literature and film engage with the more than human talent. Um, she was named Incon Excellence for assistant professor scholar uh, 2021-2023. So congratulations. And she's the co-editor of two volumes in the Environmental Humanity, Time Skills, Thinking Across Ecological Temporality, and Pushing Past the Human in Latin America. Welcome, Karen. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Adela, for, for putting together this fantastic dossier. It's so exciting to share space with scholars I greatly admire, like Thomas and Olivia as well as to meet you, Edgardo, um, and thank you, Ana, for all of your hard work um, at this important journal. Um, so I, you know, when, when Adela invited me um, to come up with a new approach to Mexican cinema, I was like, oh gosh, you know, what can I do that's new? And I was thinking about how I had just um, finished this volume with Gisela Hefes called Pushing Past the Human in Latin American Cinema. Um, it's out in SUNY's amazing Latin American Cinema um, series uh, curated by Nacho and Leslie Marsh. Um, Adela's fantastic book on Mexican revolution cinema is also there. And uh, you know, a, a moment of self-promotion, there's uh, currently a, a discount happening, a 30% off uh, for the SCMS conference. So if you're interested in, in books about Latin American cinema, now's a great time to look at their series. Um, so in that book, Gisela and I brought together scholars um, sort of developing this new and growing field of eco-criticism in Latin American cinema. And as I was starting to think about this piece, it was almost sort of like a piece of self-criticism, right? Like what did that volume not do? <laughs> And what are new approaches, new, new approaches to eco-criticism in Latin American cinema? Um, so in that volume, I think that we bring together scholars who really establish how eco-critical methods help us think about how does cinema narrate and visualize environmental crisis? How does it amplify activist efforts in environmental justice? Um, how does it help us think about environmental crisis and climate change in new ways? Um, and all of that is really wonderful. Um, but what does it not do? <laughs> um, in this piece, I sort of suggest that a blind spot of current methods in Latin American eco-criticism is the perhaps overemphasized focus on representation, on the ability of film to uh, capture and depict and amplify, um, you know, a crisis that's in motion. So I guess I wanted to think about rather than like, what if we invert the terms of this research question? So rather than think about what film does to shed light on environmental crisis, I wanted to think about how thinking with the environment sheds light on cinema. Um, and so in this article, 
I really took up Adela's invitation to sort of be experimental and even a little bit crazy in my in my claims. And, um, and th the title sort of explains it all, which is that I put forward a theory that Mexican cinema can be read as petro cinema. And by that, I'm essentially arguing that we need to think more carefully, or, or those of us who are interested in the environment and interested in questions of extractivism and the economic reliance on um, extractivist enterprise, really should think about how these economic models of national growth have intersected with culture, cultural industries like cinema. Um, so I, you know, and, and Venezuelan historians and cultural, um, you know, historians are making similar arguments, right? They're talking about Venezuela's dependence on oil and how that is both evident within cultural production, but also shapes cultural production, right? It um, shapes sort of the, the ebbs and flows of cultural production. Um, so in the article, I sort of argue that we can do something similar with Mexican cinema. Um, up until very recently, oil um, and you know um, revenue from Pemex has constituted forty percent of Mexican revenue, um, and you know that revenue funds Mexican cinema. So I look to, for instance, the the burst of the oil bubble in the early '80s as coinciding with the privatization of Mexican cinema to argue that, uh, you know, the sort of this boom of Mexican cinema was really uh, in tandem and reliant on the, the uh, increase in um, reliance on oil. So that's kind of the first claim that I make in this article. And somehow in this very short article, I make several other kind of silly or kind of nutty claims, which is um, that you know, the second of which is rather than just look at how Mexican cinema de depicts environmental crisis, we should also look to how uh, filmmakers are putting environmental concepts into practice. So I look at the first carbon neutral film, uh, Monica Alvarez Franco's documentary, Bosque de Niebla, uh, Alvarez Franco um, essentially decided to make this film in a way that uh, was aligned with the community of land defenders who she portrays. Um, so she, um, you know, conducted the film process in a way that really reduced its environmental impact. And then she ended up buying uh, carbon credits to um, account for the very small amount of carbon that was expended in film production. But from there, I kind of ask myself the question, does it matter if Mexican cinema is carbon neutral? And the answer that I come up with is no, it doesn't. Because I think if we're thinking about film in this way, uh, particularly in comparison with um, Hollywood. Uh, so, you know, right off the bat, like um, a lot of film scholars have pointed out the fact that Hollywood is the second largest um, industry in LA that emits carbon, right? So it is a really carbon intensive film industry. A lot of this expenditure of energy and resources is based off of the film that so many films in Hollywood are filmed elsewhere, right? So transportation accounts for more than half of carbon emissions for most Hollywood films, right? If you think about transporting all the crew, the set, the actors to these different locations around the world. So I sort of make this argument that, in fact, if we're thinking about strategies for making more environmentally friendly films, then really looking to Latin America and to Mexico is a great way to, to look at strategies that are already in place, that are not conceptualized as environmental practices, but that are, in fact, more environmentally friendly than a lot of Hollywood productions. So I make kind of the counterintuitive argument that No Manches Frida Dos is actually an environmental film. Uh, it was like one of the big blockbusters in Mexico. And if we look at sort of the budget and, and its filming practices that in comparison with Hollywood films, like even big Mexican blockbusters are de facto better for the environment. And then uh, I sort of conclude my, my article by saying that we should also think about the way that film has operated in tandem with oil to reinforce um, like 
ideologies of extractive excess. So I look at um, the way that Pemex has um, used film producers to create films that sort of uh, amp up Pemex's uh, image. Um, and um, those, some of those clips from those films can be seen on the extras site. So I would say just in a nutshell, um, this article is kind of um, a fun romp of random ideas that I've had about how we can push eco-critical methods to the next level, um, not just to sort of rehearse the same old argument that, wow, film helps us see environmental crisis differently, which of course it does, and those, that's still important. But I think as scholars interested in what the future of thinking about film in tandem with the environment, uh, it would really be helpful to infuse our methods with a more materialist and material approach. Thank you so much, Carolina. And I, 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 um, I think that was a fascinating article. Trace back the idea of production, and, you know, cultural production in general, and how this production really affects the way we perform our use on whatever we believe. And yeah, that's, that's very interesting. I would like now, um, Anna like to comment on them. I also invited, Nacho was in the audience, and I grabbed him from the audience and you know, brought him inside. I opened the door and said, hey, come, come inside if you want to also, you know, comment on, on, on these collaborations. Um, Anna. Uh, thank you, Adela. Um, thank you guys for your lovely so syncretic presentations of your work. I mean, I'm very familiar with all your essays at this point, obviously, since I must have read them at least 20 times a piece. And um, I, was, I was still enamored of how you presented the work um, because you all took different tacks and uh, different strategies to do so. Um, and I think through your presentations, you know, how Adela and I began the conversation obviously is, is proven, um, I would say correct, right, uh, appropriate, um, because you all have demonstrated precisely how the work that you have done, and each of your essays is vastly different from each other, right? But how what you have done in these essays kind of like pushes pushes against certain standard ways of thinking about a phenomenon, pushes against certain walls, whether there are various explicit ones like the um, Mantecón wall against Teo Hernández, right? or uh, Olivia's walls, and you, have, we, you typically deal with uh, violence or carolins, right, with, with um, climate change and the cinema, looking at representations of rather than um, impact of. Uh, and beyond the impact of though, those Pemex clips are the best ever. You know, if you watch nothing else on the SLIC Extras website, go look at those clips because they are amazing. Um, I'm not going to say anything else, anything further about them because you have to watch them to believe them. Uh, I'm simply going to cede um, the word to Nacho because he's among us and uh, we all love to hear from Nacho, whom I haven't seen in like two years, Nacho. This is ridiculous. It's not three. Well, thank you for having me. This was so unexpected that I'm wearing my sweatshirt of the legend of Zelda because I didn't even dress up. Uh, for this occasion, I of course came because I have a lot of love and friendship for the members of this panel as well as uh, admiration for their work. So it is really a privilege to have listened and to have the opportunity to do some comments, which I think reiterate some of the thoughts that I've had about this, uh, what I can call a young generation of of scholars as I have become part of the furniture of the field rather than being the young scholar that I was maybe a decade ago or so. Uh, in any case, um, I, I, I would like to present it a little bit as to where is this group of scholars taking the conversation as manifested by the very different pieces, but they do carry some common strands that are worth reflecting upon. I have my own history and genealogy of, the, of our subfield in my mind. Of course, we have Anna, who's uh, the teacher of us all, right? Who, who wrote so many important foundational pieces. Each one of them almost opened a whole subfield in film studies. 
And since Caroline brought my series to the fore, I just want to say that one of our following books is the compilation of Anna's most important essays, edited by Dolores Stierney and, and Laura Podalski. That's going to come from soon in next year. And I think it's going to really show the extent of Anna's uh, contribution and how much debt we still have to her work to this day. So it is, of course, telling that Anna is also in charge of editing uh, one the most significant journal in our subfield and that is opening the doors to this uh, conversation. So Tana, thank you for all that you do for us and it continues to manifest itself every day. And certainly I, we always have our gin and tonic conversations in SMS. So I'm really looking forward for the next in-person conference with Anna. Um, I think that I was saying that I have a genealogy of the field. And of course we have this foundational moment that Anna, in which Anna plays such a strong part of, of building the conversations, opening the doors, right? I think when I came to the fore, particularly for Mexican cinema, it was a point where we were doing two things. I think that it was a point where we were revising the legacies of the Golden Age. And I would say, for example, Dolores Tierney's book on, on Emilio Fernandez is a good example of that side of the conversation. And then there was a group of us that confronting the development of a booming of the Mexican cinema in real time after the release of Amores Perros and Itumama Tambien took upon ourselves uh, the making sense of, of this contemporary cinema that was so exciting and strong, right? And you might remember not only my own book, but also the work of Misha McLeod, right? Who wrote a very, the first one and a, a still an essential book on the, on the topic and you know, Olivia was my undergraduate student when this was happening. So we were studying that in class in very real time. But I think that moment has passed. We have a, a transnational Mexican cinema that we need to problematize in many ways. And I'm, I certainly my own projects are going in that direction. But as far as the discipline, what we're seeing is a reconsideration of the standard narrative of Mexican cinema that thinks about the, the, the industry in, in booms and crisis cycles, right? In a golden age that then has a long crisis, that then has a new cinema, right? And that now it appears to be in crisis again. And it's really trying to go into what Olivia and Brian Price just called in a recent collection, the lost cinema. Uh, looking at decades that have been neglected, uh, looking at films that are not conserved because we we raised entire decades with this narrative of crisis and i think that's what i would begin by locating uh, some of, especially the interventions by edgardo and by um, thomas um, edgardo's paper is part of a surprising to me revival of alfredo Hoskowicz. It, it so happens that there was also an article by uh, rebecca jansen just recently in the journal uh, the period of Husko weeks that, that, that uh, Edgar is looking at is very rare because the films are fairly difficult to find and they have been generally raised from historical memory, even though they were very well uh, discussed and regarded films in their time. Uh, and they really speak of something that I think uh, is unfolding in conversations about the Mexican cinema of the 70s which is how to make sense about the surplus meaning of filmmaking when you take into consideration the question of prismo, right? So we know that Hoskowitz was by and large a, a, a reluctant priesta, right? Someone that was working very much in the system, but at the same time, he has some aesthetic and political extensions to his work that, that are really worth looking and particularly the ability to, to, to approach uh, his films, his positions about the insurgency and his films about the topic are essential. And I would suggest, since I just wrote about it for Olivia's volume, that, that Hoskowitz is a very important precursor of Felipe Casals. A particular, I don't think you can, you can really conceptualize a film like Bajo la Metralla without looking at Hoskowitz back in the, in the 70s. And you cannot consider later on Rojo Amanecer and En el Aire and El Bulto. And the films that really were thinking about sort of the traces and legacies of the insurgent movements in Mexico without looking at this figuration that Hoskowitz did. In part because Hoskowitz was a, a, a teacher in the, film, in, the, in the film schools and therefore one of the teachers that formed director like Juan Carlos de Yaca, the director of En el Aire, right? So I think it, or, or he was certainly a, 
an interlocutor and maybe a contrast to the work of Gabriel Retes, right, on the same questions. So I, I think there's some there's a missing link in Hoskowitz that the work by both Edgardo and Rebecca is putting forward. I really look forward to see this reconsideration because I think that together you're building a model on how to revalue these directors that have been dismissed because of their organicity to the Prista model of filmmaking, but nonetheless are is essential precedents to, to some of the cinema we have come to value more as creating the dissidences that led to the new Mexican cinema and to the neoliberal period. And of course, I wrote myself on Playa Azul in, uh, in, in screening neoliberalism, which is a film that I discovered in the process of that research because it was, nobody really talked about Hoskowitz when we were, when I was writing the book. There's even a, a recent book on, in, by Insigne on his work. So I think that there's, a, there's an opportunity there. The question of Teo Hernandez, uh, and of course I'm not surprised that Thomas does this because Thomas has a, a sensibility of both art cinema and, and, and conceptual art that I think is unmatched in also feel. Uh, but really he is taking the conversation that has been developed by people like Vasquez Mantecón on Super Ocho uh, into a new direction. Um, the question of cinema extendido, the question of video, uh, the question of the filmmakers and artists that went to, 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 to Europe and other locations and filmed from there, right? Many of them uh, had heirs of, of someone that is very famous, but very few people write about him, of Alejandro Jodorowsky, right? Um, someone that has a, Teo Hernandez also as someone that has a parallel trajectory to the poet Ulises Carrion, who experienced a recovery recently, but is another experimental post-literary writer that was working in Amsterdam at the same time, more or less trying to break the, the, the borders of, of, of the medium the same way Teo Hernandez is doing it with video, right? And one of my professors in college was Rafael Corquidi, who was also part of this, uh, Adela might remember him from UDLA, who was part of this, uh, this movement. So I think Thomas is asking very fundamental questions. In particular, about how the concept of author and the concept of art cinema doesn't allow us to properly see actually existing artistic practices of cinema that are really exploring the problem of the medium. And also directors that are working on the spaces that dislocate the concepts of national cinema. So certainly Hernandez has a genealogy within Mexico, but the character of the, fi the filmmaker in exile that is better developed in other traditions. One can think, for example, how the work has been done on Iranian cinema after Kiarostami is something that really needs to be brought to this period where there were many filmmakers throughout the world uh, working outside the PRI really thinking on Super 8 and video as a way to circumvent the very restrictive structures of, of the unions and the radio, television, and cinematography, and all of the structures of the state. But more importantly, and I think that Thomas is very elegant in this, on the aesthetic consequences on wor of working within those uh, parallel infrastructures. So uh, I am really looking forward to hear more of Thomas's work, uh, now broadcasting from Poland, right? Uh, almost embodying as a scholar the same exile that that we're seeing that he studies in his filmmakers, but definitely a, a way of looking awry at the at the narratives of Mexican cinema. Um, Olivia's work, of course, you know, is very close to me because she was my student and, and she's probably the person that I talk to the most on Facebook Messenger. <laughs> but uh, um, I have been following Olivia, this later evolution in Olivia's work. You know that she's better known for her book in progress about stardom, her work on, on, on Lucerito, the work on the on trying to revalue popular cinema from the 70s and 80s, which I think is a very worthwhile project, not represented here, but part of the same tendency of reminding those archives of the lost decades. She, she coined the lost decades term that is now very useful to many of us. I actually was in a in a party of like intellectuals in Mexico and, and a couple of people cited her as someone that is like doing great work. So uh, I'm embarrassing her a little bit on purpose, but, but I think that she's moving into a theoretical ring uh, with her article on JCMS in Las Elegidas and now this work on La Tempestad that really put forward a question that doesn't, hap doesn't happen very much, which is the correlation between form and, 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 
a spectatorial experience of this cinema that is trying to cope uh, the question of violence. It is a very difficult question that I think Olive is handling very elegantly. I, I call this her Masumian period in, in terms of the way it is engaging uh, the theories of affect and embodiment. Uh, the, the experience that she referred about my own classroom really shows it, right? These are films that are not commercial, right? They're fairly alienating to the audiences, but they leave a significant amount of emotional trace whenever the viewers are confronted with it. It's something that just happened to me with the film Memoria, uh, which I saw in Cinetech, and it has left such a trace in me. I don't didn't particularly like it, but I cannot stop thinking about it to the point that I'm actually gonna go see it again next week that is coming to St. Louis. But there is something about the, 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 link, the way in which expecting these films that you don't like, but that are embodied into your memory of film watching, that is a very strong, and I think it's an idea that is manifested in both of Olivia's articles. There's definitely a really interesting way of reconceptualizing a lot of these films because there's a reductiveness about the approach of looking at as content. And I think that uh, the work that you mentioned of Niamh Thornton in, in her book that I just published a few months ago on how the cinema violence is curated, as well as the ideological critique. I'm actually have it right next to me in my desk that is present in Osvaldo Zavala's new book on, on the narcos, on the idea of the narco. I think that it really opens the space to reconsider the representation of violence in a more formally and more theoretical way without having to always pay mind to the sociological reception of the films, and Olivia has been very important in, in thinking this material in this direction. Uh, and finally, Caroline, of course, I always say that uh, Caroline is always 10, 10 years ahead of us in some of her thinking. So now she's in the forefront of, uh, of really thinking seriously the question of the environment, not, not as it has happened in ecocriticism as, an, as a subject of representation, but rather as a matter of infrastructure. Uh, she's aligning us to some discussions that are taking place in the Anglosphere uh, that, ha that are not, she's like our translator from, of that discourse also, right? Uh, I, I think her work, for example, very related to the work of Ming Hyun Song in, on, in the field of poetry about how the forms and the infrastructures of culture are related uh, to this. But the question, I, have, I would have never crossed my mind the question of petroleum and cinema, which should be obvious, but certainly the, the role of extraction in the infrastructure of Mexico and the way in which the, the welfare state and the program of public patrimony and culture are related to that is a, is a brilliant uh, way to understand. It's hard for me to come because it sort of blew my mind to, to hear this just now because I haven't heard it before. But we really see that there's a growing interest about revising the, the effects of petroleum as a a sort of the flooring signifier of Mexican development in culture. I think the other person who's working on it very much in depth is Emily Hine eh, in terms of literature. Eh, but eh, definitely I have to say, having ed edited the book that Carolyn put together with Gisela, it is, it, there is a groundbreaking conversation throughout film studies. Some of it has already been developed by people by, like Juicy Parica on the geology of media. But I think that in Latin America, we haven't really coped on the specificities of, 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 of the ecological infrastructure for filmmaking. And you can see even questions that open, not only the question of petroleum, but also the ecological ethics of the cinema junto al pueblo from Jorge San Ginés would be a parallel question to this. So I think that the, the article is very striking, not only for what it says about Mexican cinema, but also the methodological possibilities that it suggests for a complete reassessment of Latin American cinema historically. So thank you Adela for this impromptu invitation because I'm really stimulated from listening to this. I look forward uh, to the pieces and now I'm very happy to come speak like an elder that, that, that looks uh, from, from old age into what the young people are doing. Thank you. Thank you much. You're becoming the father and you're becoming the abuelita. So, uh, I, there are there are two there are two comments in the chat. Can you hear me fine? If, if I break, let me know. Raúl Garriga uh, says Noche de Fuego, Prayers for the Stolen by Tatiana Hueso. Me parece que tiene el balance de presentar un problema social violento 
en su génesis, pero mostrando explícitamente y desde el punto de vista del pueblo, que se ve obligado a fluir con la corriente. Se presenta como una historia local, con una perspectiva y alcance global. Comentario. Y hay otro de Beatriz Jiménez, que también va para Olivia. Doctor Cosentino, your talk reminds me of the article of body genre by Linda Williams and the way spectators react to different genres. Por ejemplo, en horror, y even the way violence is depicted there, it's a fearful church. Do you think there has been a shift in the way gendered violence has been depicted in Mexican film in a way where violence is depicted as a spectacle, but instead as a way for spectators to understand what is occurring without seeing that explicit violence? Thank you, Beatriz. Yes. Uh, a very astute question and Linda Williams body genres is, is very much in my head when I think about embodied spectatorship. Um, yeah, so I think there has been a shift. I don't want to say that obviously every film has shifted, but I think that for me, some of the most interesting films on gender violence have made that shift um, just because I mean, to a certain extent, there's just there's so much exploitation inherent in the representation of violence. Um, and so I, I would answer your question by saying that um, a lot of what I think about in the article talks about sound and image. And so thinking about the audiovisual strategies for um, getting spectators to understand violence in embodied ways that doesn't like repeat showing the violence. Um, especially in fiction film, like in Las Elegidas, there's a really, really interesting um, approach to showing rape without showing rape. Um, and that's that's in my article on slower cinema. Um, but in nonfiction cinema, um, I wanna throw back to what uh, Ana was talking about, the SLAC extras. I talk a little bit more about um, Tatiana Hueso's interview process um, and so, especially thinking about this idea of the voice in documentary and sort of the voiceover, it's like, it's women's voices. Um, so thinking about gendered violence through this sort of empowering practice of interviewing, of speaking truth to power, um, of having these like extremely long interview, interviewing um, sessions that lead to these films, I think, uh, in and of itself gestures towards a sort of different approach to dealing with violence or sort of um, processing it that avoids explicit violence, but rather prioritizes um, interiority. It prioritizes the sensations, um, the experience rather than the sort of direct representation. But your question, absolutely, absolutely relevant. I think that's a great way to think about it. Well, um, I guess we're coming to the end. Uh, I, I would like to say, Anna said, suggested at the beginning that these new approaches to revisit the long Chile history, not only of Mexican cinema, but of cinema in general, that many of the claims, the concerns that we have have been made throughout the years the role of emotion that we could affect, um, the role of production in representation, the role of the transnational in cinema or emigres, and the role of insurgency and how ambiguous it can be in relation to it. So I think these questions have been there. It's just a matter of like bringing them with new light, new approaches, and of course the fresh criticism of the young generation of scholars. And thank you so much again uh, to all of you and to Anna for the space in this magnificent journal. Uh, and if anybody else has anything to say, let's say it now. And if not, we are ready to say goodbye. Nothing else? Then we can go get a glass of wine or some coffee. Unfortunately, not together, but- Next time, next time in person, Adela. <laughs> <laughs>
next time in person, I think this is new approaches of cinema to next year in person. Okay, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you. Paloma. Thank you to everybody. Thank you, Nacho, for the you know thank last you. minute intervention. Brilliant as always. Thank you. I love Brilliant to see you always. all. That's why like, that's what I recruited him as the last minute commentator. <laughs> <laughs>